Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Wisdom House. I can't tell you how thrilled we are to have you here this afternoon. We are so excited. We are so excited about this exhibit. We are so excited to be here at Wisdom House this afternoon. And we are just thrilled that you've taken time to join us today. So thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. You're in for a just a moving experience. And so we want to thank you again. Say hello to our friends up in the balcony up there. Thank you for joining us. Um, in our two rooms here, we also have an overflow room that's being used downstairs right now. Um, so welcome to our guests downstairs. And we are Facebook Live right now, so we're just all over the place today. So very much appreciate you coming and taking time to be with us today um, for this special event. Uh, so Wisdom House, if you haven't been here before, is this very special place. Um, we actually celebrated 71 years of being in Litchfield, the Daughters of Wisdom, this year. And this uh, building that you're in, this property that you're on, um, was originated 71 years ago to um, formation for the Daughters of Wisdom, for the young women joining the community known as the Daughters of Wisdom. Uh, just a few hours ago, we celebrated over uh, on the property, the easement that the Wisdom House and the Daughters of Wisdom have made with the Litchfield Land Trust and putting 54 of our acres into an easement. So that has been exciting. And now we are here to celebrate this gallery opening today. So we again want to thank you for coming and just uh, hope that you enjoy um, your time here today at Wisdom House. So I'm going to go ahead and do our introduction here. And I'm going to start by saying it is no exaggeration to say that Lee Cantillon began his journey as a human rights photographer in the deep end, chronicling the Rwanda genocide and its aftermath in 1994. David Goatley, the renowned portraitist, would introduce this exhibit with these words. Lee Cantillon's photographs of the diaspora in Nigeria, much like his photography from the Rwanda crisis, take the viewer beyond the headlines and into the lives of individuals in a way that makes the historical suddenly very personal. There is a striking intimacy in his portraits of both victims and perpetrators that is very real. Here are people you could know and in knowing them, never forget. As we look into these faces, we don't see strangers, we see ourselves. Lee went on to photograph poverty in inner cities in this country, the racial divisions he witnessed in South Central Los Angeles during many years spent in that city. In 2014, he began documenting poverty among the Dalit and outcast poor in India, including the plight of the Banjari Gypsies. Three years later, in the winter of 2017, the opportunity arose to document girls released or rescued from Boko Haram. There were very few to accept this challenge, and this mission took him into the heart of the tragedy surrounding the insurgency in northern Nigeria today. Along the way, he was the first to interview and photograph Leah Sharibu's family after her kidnapping in February of 2018. His photographs have been widely seen since and have been often the only photographic record of the crisis used in advocacy missions at the State Department, sessions in Washington, D.C., and London, England, as well as for Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and other groups working on behalf of the thousands of girl hostages. Gloria Samdi Poldu, professor of political science in Joss, and the founder of the Leah Foundation has said, Lee's images have put a very human face on what is too often a faceless and anonymous crisis. His photographs on behalf of Leah Sharibu have made her story real for countless numbers of people today. A Place for You, the exhibit hosted here at Wisdom House, focuses on the real people who are a part of this crisis that shames the world, shining a light on the reality of thousands of young girls held hostage and of the response that is wanting except for the courageous and selfless efforts of many unsung heroes. He will speak today more about this as he shares and even as his photographs speak and have a voice of their own. Would you at this time please welcome Lee Cantalone to the podium. Thank you.
Yeah, it's very, um, it's really hard to even begin today. Um, for me, sensing the sacredness of this moment. Um, my friend David said to me uh, some time ago, uh, whenever it came up about showing these pictures, about using these pictures, he got kind of mad at me one time on the phone and said, it's not up to you, bro. You know, it's a sacred trust that you've made with the people in these pictures. I hope I can represent them today. Um, to be vulnerable is a, is a common enough term. We, we all know that term. You know, this, this, this people group are vulnerable. But to be vulnerable is to have no voice, to be anonymous, to have no one to speak for yourself and to have no one to speak to on behalf of yourself. Uh, and millions and millions of people, the numbers of displaced people and those that have been made without place, the theme of this exhibit was a place for you. And it was very, uh, it seemed like the perfect theme for this topic. Um, all of the people that are represented in these pictures, uh, August of 2019, uh, all the rest on that wall are from January of this year. Um, there's one picture from August, one picture from November of last year, and then the rest are, uh, and many of the, in, in the exhibit are from January this year. All of these people come from that community of displaced that have lost their homes, often lost their families. And I can't imagine, I, I was speaking about this earlier just before the event began, I cannot imagine what they would feel seeing their pictures here. It's, it's very moving for me. I think there would be a lot of tears. So I'm, I'm working my way past the emotion of just seeing you people here today and by your presence proclaiming, just, just even without realizing even, your advocacy for, for these precious women and girls and young boys. Um, because by being here, you represent them. By being here, you say you matter, right? By being here, you say you have a name. That's lied to there with her niece, um, Angela, who had just been rescued about two months before that picture was taken. And we're still going through trauma work in Kaduna State. Um, but for them to see a gathering that says, I'm come here because of you. You didn't come here for me, because I, I know I have some good friends here, but I think we came here because something drew us to this topic. And that's that we all have the chance to be that advocate. It's all about the power of yes, about saying, yeah, I, even if it's just yes, you matter. That's such an opening to, to this story. Um, there's a lot of backstories here. Uh, this is Rebecca Sh uh, Sharibu, who I can mention, and her daughter Leah. Um, the memory of the Chibuk kidnappings, everyone remembers that, 2014, when hundreds of girls were taken by Boko Haram, came to world attention for the first time. It had been an ongoing uh, tactic of Boko Haram when they started to take vulnerable girls specifically. It was an act of demoralization to the local population. It was very degrading to the families. Um, it ties into human trafficking. And so, and it was just easy. You know, if, I, if I'm gonna kidnap, uh, you know, anyone, let's just kidnap high school girls, junior high school girls. Um, and this started, uh, in 2011 and then in 2014 uh, became world attention with the Chibuk kidnappings. And then it kind of went off the radar, just kind of faded away. There were many other crises taking place. Um, 
the, the problems in Syria and all, all over the world, very similar situations. We were talking about this earlier. Follow the money. A lot of these horrible events in the world, you know, who's funding them? You know, who's funding Boko Haram? They're, they're a very sophisticated paramilitary. Um, and most of the members of their uh, militia or whatever you want to call them, their, their pro-military unit, um, come from dire poverty, come from nothing. And yet they're very, very well equipped and equipped enough to house and care for the between 3,000 and 10,000. And I'll just say that again, because that's how unsure the world bodies that govern these things are about the number of hostages, which also speaks to how anonymous the situation is, how overlooked that there's no real census, there's no real accurate taking of these lives. They don't matter. This is what it means to be displaced. And when we talk about a place for you, we just, I'll just digress for a minute. When we say a place for you, you meet someone, oh, nice to meet you, where are you from? And immediately you start setting up your identity. You know, you can also ask, what do you do, and all these things, but it's, where are you from? You know, I'm from California, I'm from Litchfield. And when you take that away, and on top of that, there's no record of the names of these hostages, um, you really end up with what the UN and, and Human Rights Watch coined as the internally displaced people. They're within their own country, they're not refugees, but they are completely taken away and, and really put into a, almost a, a zone of, of invisibility. You know, no one's really after, you know, looking after them, trying to help them. It's, you know, you're basically on your own. And so th this crisis with the girls being kidnapped just was world news 2014, then faded away. And in February 19, of 2018, so four years later, just under four years later, uh, Boko Haram took 110 girls, 109 girls uh, from Dapchi uh, uh, school uh, in, in Yobe state, and among them was Leah Sharibu. And it was the first time in all the years that this had been going on that one of the hostages had a name that got outside. It was the first time. This is an inconceivable thing to me. I mean, it just breaks my heart. Because if you can imagine living here in this country, if there was a group kidnapping and had taken 10,000, let's say, girls, high, junior and high school girls, think of the, uh, this would be, an, you know, it would, it would be devastating, there would be a lot of response. And we would know their names. And Leah was the first hostage among them to ever get announced. Even from the Chibuk girls, there was never any roster, there was never any effort. And this speaks to us too. This speaks to our callousness and our cynicism that we would get all alarmed about what happened and where was the, where was the demand, I want to know who those girls are. That is a lot of shame. And we bear two things, we bear two crosses at this moment. One is the cross of responsibility for the situation. And the other is the light burden. Jesus said, take my burden upon you because it's light of saying yes and doing something. Because when you do that, an amazing amount of things will happen in your life. There's no doubt. In the, in the gospels, and we're in a chapel and it just seemed so absolutely almost necessary to say this, that there's a passage in John 14 where the followers, the disciples of Jesus got very uh, upset, got very alarmed, got very excited because they st started to get the idea that, you know, Jesus is saying to them, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be out of here pretty soon. You know, I'm leaving. And this panicked them mightily. And, you know, Judas, who always gets the front microphone whenever any problems happen in the Bible, you know, in the New Testament, you know, Judas grabs the mic and goes, what are we supposed to do? What's going to happen to us? 
And this is a really good question, you know. Hey, we're living in a time when to be displaced has so many different meanings. And especially if you add the word internally, you know, to be internally displaced. I think 2020 has been internal displacement for pretty much everyone. We've all had to, you know, re resell, you know, re address, re-identify what we do, how we do it. Uh, it seems like truth and fact have never been more, you know, unattainable or, or, or elusive. And there's just so much going on. And it's not just with, with the, the COVID thing, we're all sitting here masked, doing our best to deal with it, but it's so many other issues. And so this idea of being internally displaced, of having that Judas moment where you go, what? the heck am I supposed to do? You know, we were going to follow you. This was the plan, and now you're leaving. And there were so many different things that it seems to me that Jesus could have said, like, don't worry. And, he, and it does come up in John 14. But the main thing he turns to them and he says, I've already prepared a place for you. And that, to me, became the, the mandatory theme for this, that through grace and through, through advocacy and through working on behalf of those that have no voice and of those that are, that are in the situation of all of these beautiful people, that it's creating a place and it's creating a place for the people who are advocating and working and on behalf and giving voice to as well as for the persons they're helping. John Piper talked about this idea that there was a great commission which is to go and do good things and to talk and spread good news and to make something positive happen. And John Piper said, the Great Commission is great, but its greatest aspect, maybe, is the fact that it transforms anyone that gets involved. You know, you cannot stay in the same place once you say yes to something. A, 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 just a totally unbelievable aspect of this whole story is the, is the state of Connecticut. <laughs> and I have to say that. I'm not from Connecticut originally, but this state has done more to, on behalf of the hostages, the girls in Nigeria, and on, for Leah Sharibu than any other state in, the, in, in this country. And, and, and then any other place in the world is per capita. I mean, this has been the, the numbers of people that are involved, the uh, the attention that was brought to the State Department, to Human Rights Watch, to Amnesty, uh, across the board, um, the, the attention that was drawn to Leah's uh, being hostage and the inactivity on her behalf was initiated almost entirely by people, when they were Americans involved or, or non-Nigerians, it was almost all people from Connecticut. It's just an amazing thing. So, you guys are already in a position of having taken a role. You know, the state has taken a role in that regard. Um, this was, you know, Rebecca when she was here in October of last year um, and came to speak to the UN and to, she came without a passport, uh, thanks to Kyle Apps and people at the State Department that waived her status and actually flew her here so that she could be an advocate for her daughter and for the, X number of thousands of girls who we still don't have their names. Those names are being collected, by the way. But Leah is the one that we know the most. Um, Peter Fredheim, Miriam Fredheim, 20 years in Joss, um, really doing an amazing work. Almost all of these works are directly responsible um, there's actually only one picture in here that's not part of the 110 people staff of volunteers and paid workers that are helping transition women and girls to safe uh, locations in the South. Um, Gloria Samdi Puldu, who I'll mention later, um, is the founder of the Leah Foundation and of Give Her Voice, was also present uh, in the Senate and the Congress to talk on this subject. Um, she was, uh, she was here with Rebecca when they came. And, you know, it's hard. I, I'm doing my best to not get super emotional. So, I mean, I, I would rather just play a video. But, um, you know, I'd, pro I'd probably tear up doing that too. 
Um, I'm really grateful, yeah, to uh, my friend Craig. Um, and I, I just really wish she could be here today. She's, he's, he's here in his spirit, though. He's, he's, you know, just not feeling good. But um, 30 years ago, um, he, he felt in his heart that he wanted to be involved and he was going to find a way to be involved. And, you know, he had to, his trial and error, he just kind of set out and said, I'm going to do something. And I'm just going to believe that if I do my best, it's going to come to me who I can support and who I can help. And he's brought along with him and in two generations of family and uh, their company, Microboard, um, which I'm really very proud to be part of. Um, but I just, I just get very, you know, it just blows me away because I, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't, I never had that long tenure. Uh, I don't have that seniority of commitment. You know, I was in Rwanda in 94, but you know, when I got back from Rwanda, I, I took a hard right or a left turn and went, you know, that, that's a little too much. I'm gonna do something way, way easier. And um, I, you know, only by a number of amazing circumstances, none of which I orchestrated, um, God seemed to have a different plan. So in 2011, you know, things changed and, and I started on a pathway that led to some of these things, which, you know, is, is all to do with grace and not me. But, um, my friends at Microboard, they just, they've, they've just been truly sacrificial, not just convenient assistance, but really going um, to say 100% that would be accurate uh, in their efforts. And I mean, it's not, just, uh, it's not just supporting something, but it's finding ways to do it meaningfully, transparently, and with integrity. And I was talking with uh, Michael Marin last week, um, who was the New York Times correspondent in Biafra, and then for many, many years was the uh, African correspondent desk at the Times. And we were talking about this very thing, that in the, non, in the nonprofit, in the, in the NGO work in places like Africa, uh, it sounds good, and then you start un you start uncovering all kinds of complex problems, and you know, and, and the idea of transparency, integrity is so critical, of of being real, of really affecting change, of, of doing something within the local communities that will last and that is theirs. And he wrote an entire book on this subject about the fact that you know, you can get involved in in charitable nonprofit work in, in, in areas that are desperate situations and you can end up, you can result with more damage done than good. So it's a very, very critical part of the discussion. And I just have watched that over the years as uh, pr progressively uh, the, the friends that I just mentioned have, have found ways to be more transparent, to, to really work with sustainable projects that if the funding stops tomorrow that project is going to have roots and grow and what's happening with the relief work being done in Nigeria now is so it's a it's that I, again, it sounds very political the city on the shining hill but it's 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 an example that I just I look at and I go wow that's humbling to be involved with something that's so that's so real like that um there's, the other question that always comes up is uh, the, the situation, whether it's in Syria, whether it's in, you know, the rebuilding of what's taking place in Rwanda post the, the genocide, or whether it's the situation in Nigeria. Oh, it's so huge, you know, what can my part do? What can I do? You know, how can I, you know, what's my involvement gonna mean? And don't let that ever, ever enter your mind. You know, the, the, the famous quote you all know from the Talmud that, you know, he or she who saves one life saves the world entire. I mean, it, 
nothing good, nothing positive, nothing lasting ever started, you know, by hundreds and thousands of people all deciding to do it at the same time. It starts with one person in the middle of the night who triggers another person and the thing grows. There's a, there's a reason why it talks about faith being like a mustard seed. It's so small, you know, you say, yeah, I've got faith so small, I lost it in my pocket, I don't know where it is, don't ask me, because I can't even find my, you know, I had faith when it came in this morning, and, you know, it's a mustard seed, I don't have it, I don't know where it went, I had a thought, it escapes me now. And I think hope is like that too. You know, hope is something that you go, I had a, you know, you've, what's, the, what's the catchphrase? A glimmer of hope. A glimmer is not a, you know, it's not like a light that you can leave on for 20 hours. It's not, it's not your outdoor halogen. It's a glimmer. And that's all it takes. So just take that to heart. In, in, and I'm, I'm getting, this could be Sunday morning now. Um, no, I just want to roll here with this um, New Testament thing. Um, there's a really great thing that, you know, St. Paul, love him or hate him, people are, you know, can be opinionated on that. Um, he said, hope makes not ashamed. And that's, that's, that sounds so poetic, thanks to the translators of the King James, who, you know, gave it a really nice Shakespearean ring to it, but hope makes not ashamed. And you think, well, what does that mean? You know, you could you have a really good, you know, if you had five people, you could toss that around, you get five opinions. But hope is the dignity that it gives to the person that's hoping for and the person that is receiving it. Hope is an identity. You know, courage, all the things that we would like to have mentioned in our bios or mentioned in our introductions, they all start with hope. I'm courageous because this can happen. And you're looking at a situation like in Nigeria and you go, I don't see how that can happen. I don't see the solution for 10,000 possibly girls in the Chad Niger, Niger Basin. I don't see how that's gonna happen, but I am not gonna let that make me not hopeful that something can happen. And, it, and if nothing else, I'm gonna do something. Wisdom House was really cool in saying if you put the pictures up, We'll sell the pictures, we won't take a commission, and you can give 100% of the proceeds to the actual place where the picture's from. But they got a whole number system and that's cool. And it's just like in, in things like that where you go, wow, you know, to wave our part in things anytime we get a chance and say, look at all that we have, look at all the liberty, look at all the place we have, in spite of 2020, in spite of all that's going on, in spite of November 3, however you are on that, in spite of all these anxieties, in spite of all the memories of Selma and all the other stuff that's going on, all the systemic poverty in this country, I still am not gonna let that keep me home. I'm gonna do something. Even if it seems like one small thing, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna tell somebody. My friend Ricky wrote a song called Tell Somebody and that is what it is. It's like, I am gonna be the voice. These people, all the people in these pictures, um, the one in the very back on, the, on the, my left is one of the girls with Leah Sharibu uh, the night that she was taken, or the afternoon rather, it was afternoon and evening, it was three hours that their school was under attack. That's one of the girls that was with her. She actually held her hand and tried to pull her away from the school. Um, Leah went back to rescue one of the other girls. And I did a, uh, I sat with him, uh, I sat with her several times, um, and she's from Dopchi. And she was kind enough to tell her story, which she allowed me to write it down. And she said, my friend's name is Leah, and she's a hostage now. She was only 14 years old when she was taken captive. The word taken, it was such an amazing interview. The, world, the word taken still has the power to shock me. The idea that a person can just be removed like a thing. She was profound behind her years, that's for sure. Taken away from her life, her family, and she became a property. 
She was now owned by Boko Haram. She was with me at the government's girls' science and technical school on February 19th, 2018, and it was early evening, late afternoon, when the terrorists came. There were shots, and we were screaming and scattering in one direction and then in another. We fell down. In groups of two or three, we were captured and were taken towards trucks. The air was suddenly smoky, and the static of the sound of violence and screams. And some of the girls, like me, managed to escape. We are hiding beneath beds. We are hiding in a ditch beneath branches. One has thorns behind school buildings. Some are still in plain sight and lay down and try to be flat. One girl has hold of Leah's hand. And that girl is me. I am pulling her towards safety, but her hand falls, and then she runs back to the school to see if she can help. The terrorists put them in trucks. Their doors look like open mouths. Leah is among them, and it's a nightmare that won't stop. Darkness comes and it is cold. And the few hours have filled our lives, have been like hell. She went on to explain that for possibly three to five days, which is now what we assume that's how long it took them to get to the camp where they were taken in the back of these trucks, uh, no, no provision for them for sure. And when they got the girls to the camp, there was an argument about where to position them, where to take them. So they said, OK, we're going to return. These girls come from a Muslim territory. We're going to return them. And not that being Christian or Muslim or, or tribalist has any effect on who Boko Haram chooses their victims. That's, it's, it's, a, it's, a gender, uh, it's a gender youth uh, target, nothing to do with your uh, uh, religious affiliation or your tribal background, tribal identity. But during that time, they went around and they said, you know, counted them off. Um, five of the girls died during the, the, the transition to the camp. And when they got to Leah, they said, um, will you, uh, someone said, oh, she's a Christian. That girl's a Christian, you know, and she was like one of the few, maybe probably the only one at that time in that group. And they said, okay, just renounce your faith and you can get back in the truck and go back to Dopshi. And Leah at that moment said no. And I, it's inconceivable to me. I don't want to ever try and imagine how I would hold up in that situation. Who's hearing me? You know, who's, who's keeping a record? I mean, sure, in, in a, in a, in a in a big sense of the word, there is a record being taken. But at that moment, you know, it's like, hey, stay in the Boko Ram camp or, or, or go, you know, or go with us, you know, or go, with, or go home. And she chose to, to stay. That was you know, more than two years ago. It's two and a half years. And Wooly Soyinka, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, for literature in 86 and was the first African writer to ever receive the Nobel Prize for literature. Um, spent 22 months in, um, <laughs> 20, it's like a duet. Um, he was in prison for 22 months. He said, we have to celebrate the exception of one who said no, just like Mandela said no. When Leah said no, she spoke for us. And I read that, and I was just like, wow. I mean, she was 14 years old. You know, that's her picture painted by David Goatley. Um, you know, she's 14 years old. She spoke for us. Her torch much, must not be dimmed. And Gloria, uh, here, here. I'm just going to read something that came in this morning. 
uh, Gloria Samdi Puldu, who's been the uh, woman that has uh, really given up everything to go full time into working on behalf of these girls. And she's one of the most uh, inspiring people I think I've spent time with um, because I always feel like no matter what any effort that I've made, it's like, you know, crap, I got to do way more, you know, seriously. I just look at her and I look at the tenacity and I look at her strength and her strength of spirit and her courage. But she said, I want to speak on uh, behalf of Leah, her, her mom, her dad, and by extension, all of the Nigerian women for the great support and love from the people of Connecticut, uh, from Wisdom House, uh, from Microboard. We are so grateful that you advocate for Leah and for all the girls. Um, her crime is that she refused to submit to her captors. She's 14 years old. That sounds like such a I mean, I'm thinking of like, you know, Richard the Lionhearted, you know, this type of thing. You know, I refuse to submit to my captors. I've been close to some of the, I've, you know, gotten close enough to see and, and spend time, like I was sharing earlier before this, with Muhammad Issa and Ahadji ah Suleiman Yakubu and guys that were ideologues of Boko Haram. And I don't picture myself doing very well saying, I refuse to submit to you. You know, they're kind of terrifying you know, they're almost terrifying looking in the, in the sense of a, a Michael Bay movie. I mean, you know, they've got the whole thing going, you know. They are warlords, basically, a lot of those guys. And it says that, thank you for, for Leah for who refused to submit to her captors. Many are in different forms of captivity today. This is Gloria again. Either for their beliefs or their gender, their race, their economic status. There's a type of captivity that goes with anything negative that we use to say that makes you count less. And she says, I want to thank you, Lee, for visiting Nigeria um, to meet the victims and for the team at Microboard and all the ones working in Connecticut to encourage us to do this more. I don't know. I don't know what encouragement other than just saying, you know, just acknowledging Gloria, you know, and by saying, yeah, I'll show up. Um, I want to mention something about the power of yes, uh, because we were talking about this earlier, but uh, this is where it starts. Uh, you know, the agreement that you have with yourself and your God or, or someone in your family, or when you just verbalize and find yourself saying, I'll do that. It doesn't matter what it is, but you don't even have to know how, how that is ever gonna work, but you say, yeah, I'm available. And man, I'm telling you, that is a powerful, powerful thing. You know, in, in the Christian faith, they talk about the will of God and all of these things, but it all starts with willingness and acceptance of, of your part, whatever it is. Because no matter what you are given in your faith or in your spiritual life or in your path, it always starts with you being willing to take the step. It's, it's not just dropped, it just doesn't drop in front of you. It's something that you say, yeah, I'll do that. And you think, wow, where'd that come from? I went to the new school in New York uh, in 2017. Uh, I hurried down there after work uh, because I, my brother was going to play piano at this event on, it was called Writers at War, and it was, uh, they were having this, Stephen Hoff from Stillwaters in a Storm in Bushwick was hosting this evening at the New School on like a Thursday night, and he called me at four o'clock, <laughs> and I'm in Seymour, Connecticut, and he goes, I'd really like you to be here, Paul's going to play piano between all the different speakers, and I'm like, yeah. And it, so anyway, got on the train, got down there, and very excited to see my brother, who I'm really, you know, my best friend. And um, yeah, it was a great night. And there was this photographer there. His name was Ashley Gilbertson. 
and uh, you would recognize his work if you saw it. Um, and so he talked about photographing three girls that had been rescued and released from Boko Haram. It's, uh, the picture in the back is, uh, without, is unintentionally very much like the picture, one of the pictures Ashley took. So I was like, oh man, I, I have to apologize to him you know, afterwards and say, I did not plagiarize you, that just happened. Um, but he's, he's speaking about this topic and it was so amazing and then at the, and it hit me so hard and then at the end I was talking with him afterwards and Steve said, well, let's, have, let's st stay overnight and let's have dinner tomorrow or lunch and Ashley goes, um, if you ever get a chance to go to Nigeria to pick this up, because nobody's doing this, no one is going up there and documenting these girls. And it's just, it's just such a tragedy. He said, if you ever get a chance to do that, do it. And I said, yeah, I will, sure, absolutely. You know, we were like, yeah, totally. And that was it. I got home, uh, I live in uh, Northfield, and my friend Nico was living with me at the time, and, and he said, how'd the thing go in New York yesterday? And I said, it was good. And I said, um, yeah, I think I might go to Nigeria. <laughs> and he was like, why? And I was like, well, I'm gonna photograph girls that are released from Boko Haram. And he, he was like, yeah, that's great. Yeah, let me know how that works out. <laughs> um, and about seven weeks later, this, this guy who I would love to have been here today, Larry Fullerton, who's at Blackrock, it's a church in Fairfield, he, he called and said, there's this couple and they come from Nigeria and they're here and I think you two should meet. And I went down to Fairfield and there was this big conference going on, like a missions conference. And, and everybody was being very mission-y. Everyone's been to one of these events, right? And, uh, and here was Peter Fredheim, who was not being very missiony. So anyway, long story short, we sat and talked for like three hours. And at the end of that, the, the bond was, I mean, I think the bond happened in the first five minutes, but he said, you gotta come, you gotta document this stuff. You gotta, I'm, and I pictured something so different than what he was saying, because I thought he was saying, come to my house in Joss, and I'll kind of bring the people to you and you just photograph them. And you know, I was thinking like, this is nice. I'll be eating you know, rice and you know, be in his house and it'll be fun and take these pictures and, um, and uh, you know, write their stories down. That's, you know, I was looking forward to that. I was really excited about that. And so in November, uh, the latter part of November of 2017, I got there and he kind of debriefed me and let me get over jet lag for about five hours, and, um, and then he said, tomorrow, uh, you're gonna go up north. We've, we've set up some uh, people up there that are gonna help you get to where these people are, and you're gonna go, and, 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 you're gonna, and they're just gonna be so thrilled to see you come, and it's gonna mean the world, and I'm like so unprepared for this, you know, and I've, I'm reading on the plane, and I'm thinking like, this, I should have read this before I said I was coming. You know, it was a little bit like, okay, that's not helping. And, but I had no out, you know, I can't leave. So I ended up in the North and that moment at the new school suddenly made, made total sense. It's like, be careful what you say yes to, but don't be afraid to say yes because insanely good things happen. Don't, don't let it slip by. Um, Man, I am so long-winded. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh said, discussing God is not, I have notes, I should look at them, <laughs> is not the best use of our energy, but if we touch the Holy Spirit and are touched in return, we touch God not as a concept, but a reality. And I would encourage you to read some Thich Nhat Hanh and, and see how that works because it's a very powerful truth. None of, none of the next step stuff about any of this is within our grasp. Absolutely not. You know, you've got 
Africa desk experts that study this thing, you know, six days a week, and they'll throw up their hands in despair. But when the Holy Spirit's involved with your decision to say yes, the place for you is already prepared. Absolutely. I, I just seen it so many times. And I just closing, I wanna just gonna turn this on. Um, all the time I've been doing this, it started with um, when you come in the front, um, you'll see a big color picture. It's like the only color, that has a little color in it, but it's the only color picture in the exhibit. Um, it was taken in November of 2017. And one of the places they took me to uh, was a safe house uh, in uh, Gombe State. Um, it's run by a woman named Mama Yidi, which means Mama Love in Hausa. And she was, she had had a, a, a government position and had left without funding, without support, had found this house, had, had built a wall around it with help, had put up a little farm, and she said, I want to help, because she saw this constant train of young girls and women on the roads and in places where they didn't belong, and they had nowhere to go and nowhere to transition to, and she said, I can't take them all, but I'm going to take as many as I can. And so she didn't have any money, she just started this thing, and I got dropped off there, with, at a, rode up in a van, and they said, okay, you know, and they, the last part of the trip, they were like, Can, do you mind laying down? Because we were in, you know, it's a little visible. And so I'm staying there at Mama Yiddy's. They don't have like, any electricity, and they didn't have any, uh, you know, no cell phones or anything working there. And uh, the first night I was there, they said, oh, you know, it's, a, it's this whole compound, our women in transition, they'll be a little unnerved at your being here, so if you'll just sleep in that room over there. And um, it was a, just a simple like 10 by 10 cement room. So I was like, okay, this is, you know, as long as I'm out of the way, good. So I laid down in the corner, I was trying to make a bed with my stuff I had in my pack. And um, one of the girls comes in and, I, and there was a girl that could translate. She says, don't sleep there, sleep over there. And I was just in an empty room and I was like, oh, okay. And there was no, like, no windows or anything, so I'm, I'll sleep over on this side. And I said, why do, I, I might have felt annoyed, I don't know. But I was like, why do I have to sleep? I just, and, they, and she said, no, it's just that you're sleeping in the spot where the snakes drop in. So I was like, <laughs> I was like oh. But um, the first morning I was there, it was like 4, 4.30 in the morning. And, you know, went to bed at like 8 o'clock because it got dark. And we had a fire, and, and I, would, I had a person that could translate for me. And I said to Mommy Yiddy, this is, you know, the amazing amounts of naivety that you bring with you. Um, it gets stripped away. It does, pretty fast. <laughs> but um, I said to her, uh, it was kind of cool, and the weather was changing, and I, and I said, hey, what's your favorite time of year? You know, making brilliant conversation. And uh, she said, the rainy season. And I said, oh, because, yeah, because of the crops and because of this. And she goes, no, there's just a lot less killings. And I said, oh, okay, right. You know, so that, all these reality checks. But in the morning, I woke up and I could hear this singing. And it was all the women in the center. They'd gotten up and they'd started a fire. And that picture of what looks like a nativity scene to me of the woman in gold, uh, I came out, that's about 10 minutes to five, and there was that woman sitting there with her child. She had only come to the center two days before, and she looked so perfect. And I just thought, wow, she is so, the value of us. Huh, think about it. Think of the value in this room. It's amazing. Our families, our, our, our you know, our, our families before us, our parents, all the stuff that we've hoped and aspired for, all the stuff that we're potentially able to do. How could you put a value on that? And I'm looking at this woman going, well, she is so perfect and valuable and wonderful. How could she be put, cast aside like that? How could, she, how could everything be taken from her? 
And it was too dark to take the picture because it was just that little fire. And I mean, it was black. You know, it was a, there was a big overcast that night. And so there, were not, there wasn't even any starlight or early morning light. And I took that picture and it shouldn't have come out at all. I mean, it's, it's grainy if you look at it, but I, it was just like that was it. And, it, and then this singing. And so I started recording this. Every time I went back, I've been to Nigeria five times uh, since November 2017. And every single time I went back, I would take my cell phone and record uh, the girl singing. And I wanted to close with, I, I brought this little speaker, which makes a happy sound. There you go. And, and it was recorded in, in, a, in a place called Basa. And the, the girls there were, um, there's 70 girls in this center. And these had all suffered from being either hostage or they were all internally displaced. Most of them were orphans now. Um, their, their parents were either dead or gone. Another thing that I have to mention is that, that when a person is captured or when a person has been displaced by Boko Haram, they often can't go back to their community once they're rescued because of the stigma. But I, um, I came up in the, in the morning in Basa and I heard these girls singing and I thought, I'm gonna record that. And so I sent it to my brother out in LA when I, this was a cell phone recording. And um, I said, can you help me with this? Because I wanna start putting orchestration music to, to these girls. I, I, want their, I want their stuff to be as good as it can be. And I want to get that music back to them. And Gloria's been working with me and Peter and Miriam. And oh, it's been just, it's been so cool. Because one of the women that sang, not on this recording, but one of the women was 97 years old. Her name was Milka Loki. And when she heard her voice with orchestration, they just, she wrote me in, in, in Yoruba, which I don't obviously read. And it was, I just saw that there were a lot of exclamation points. And it's the, it's the gift that we can give, you know, just saying, you matter. And, and this is the girls from this recording.
Jackson. Um, I thought to just close with something that Daniel Berrigan said. It seemed appropriate to read his words um, at Wisdom House. But he made this challenge. He said, sometime in your life, hope that you might see one starved man or woman or child, the look on their face when the bread finally arrives. And he could have stopped there, right? But then he said this, hope then that you're the one that might have baked it or bought it or even kneaded it yourself for the look on their face, for you meeting their eyes across a simple piece of bread at that moment, you might be willing to lose a lot or suffer or die a little to yourself. Thanks for coming out. Thanks. Thank you, Lee. Thank Sorry, you. that's kind of loud. There's really not much more I can say to that. I've just been privileged this week because these pictures have been hanging all week in the gallery and here in the chapel. And I've spent time every day this week just looking at these pictures, looking at these faces, and just a roller coaster of emotion. Um, and Lee had mentioned, what is that one thing? You know, and I thought all week, what is the one thing I can do? How can I make a difference? And I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I know there's something that we all can do. And so I want to encourage you to just take time and look at these pictures and think about that one thing. I know 2020 has been just a crazy year when you think about what we've gone through. But when I compare what I've gone through this year to what these people have gone through, they're just, there's no comparison. There's, there's nothing. You know, there wasn't a time this year that I couldn't pick up the phone and call my kids and speak to them. I've never had to worry about anything like that. And so there's just... No comparison what we enjoy here in the States and what these people have gone through. And yet if you look at their faces and their smiles and their eyes, it just is humbling and inspiring uh, in so many ways. So I want to stop. I want to give you time to go and enjoy it. Um, what I want you to do, um, obviously we're limited to how many we can put in the gallery. So we're going to ask you to go in at four at a time. Um, but we have refreshments set up um, for those in this room. The refreshments are right behind you. This room, there will be refreshments back there. Take some time, enjoy the refreshments, and then take time to look at the pictures. And as Lee spoke about, any of these pictures, if you choose to purchase, all the proceeds will go to the center or to the place where these people are being taken care of, where they are being nourished, where they are um, receiving training to do what they need to do to take care of themselves. So again, we want to thank you for coming. We have some special visitors with us today. If you are a daughter of wisdom, would you just raise your hand, please, so we can recognize all of the daughters of wisdom here in the house today. We thank you for coming and making the trip here. I also want to let you know this um, gallery will be up through December. So I know oh, that wow. there's people that need to see it that aren't here today. And I hope you know someone as well. And you can come at any time. 
um, and view it again and spend more time in there than you'll get today. So again, thank you for coming. Thank you to our staff. Thank you to everybody that made today happen. And Lee, thank you so much thank for you. your work. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.